Davos to discuss the most important issues. And today we have a speaker whose um, uh, career and whose um, uh, professional knowledge fits um, quite well to this series. Professor Zimbardo is a very well-known social psychologist who have studied the nature of uh, humanity, the nature of evil, of social norms, expectations, and trauma for many years. And he will share his wisdom today with us during his lecture. And also today we have a moderator, uh, Natalia Humenyuk. She is a well-known Ukrainian journalist, author, and filmmaker. Uh, since the start of the Russian full-scale invasion to Ukraine, Natalia has appeared regularly as the author of um, major international venues like The Guardian, Washington Post, Rolling Stone, and others. And she will moderate the second part of, of the conversation. I will share the screen now with the slides by um, Professor Zimbardo, and uh, he will start his lecture. So thank you for staying with us and uh, enjoy it. Professor Zimbardo, the, please, okay. uh, the floor is yours. And then I, I, you will you will know uh, when I read a slide to go to the next one. So I want to talk about my personal journey from creating evil and also experience evil in many different ways to now pioneering everyday heroism. Next. So what makes good people go wrong is a question I've been asking since I've been a, was a child growing up in a ghetto in the South Bronx where evil was all around. It was toxic, uh, drugs, gangs. Um, and, and so as a child, I was wondering why I had good friends that did very bad things and some of them even went to prison. Next. So I, I'd like you to focus on this uh, illusion by Swiss artist MC Escher. And if you look at the black and make the white the background, you see a world full of demons. And now if you reverse your perception, look at the, at the white, you see a world filled with angels. And so my presentation is about how our world has been and always will be filled with good and evil, angels and devils. And the, the role of democracy is to promote goodness in people and reduce the danger of evil as uh, Ukraine is facing now uh, with the evil invasion by Putin. Uh, um, I, I'll, I think I'll, I have warm up music by Carla Santana, Change Your Evil Ways. Uh, um, I think we could skip it, uh, but it's something that you, you might want to hear. So what is evil? Evil is the exercise of power. It's all about someone who has power and they use that power to intentionally harm other people psychologically, hurt other people physically, and even kill them, destroy. And crimes against humanity is genocide by nation. And that's really what Putin is trying to do now. But there's evil not only in people, but in corporations. They allow fraud, corruption, bullying, and willful blindness to ongoing immorality in their company. So I identify three types of evil. Most people, most, most researchers have focused only on one individual evil. And then we look for the personal disposition of, of people who have done bad things. And then we, we can call them the bad apples. What my research has added is the focus on situational evil. It's social and physical environments. It's the bad barrel that corrupts even good apples. But then I add another third level. We have to look at systemic evil. These are the bad barrel makers. So these are the influences of political, economic, cultural, and legal uh, that, uh, that can be, those can be evil as well. And those are the biggest dangers to the world. And often they go unnoticed uh, because um, uh, uh, it's like the mafia, they hide behind the scenes. Oh, so it's rotten apple or rotten barrel. Next. So here's a classic example of situational evil that I created, which had its 50th anniversary recently. As you know, it's called the Stanford Prison Experiment. I did it with several graduate students back in 1971. Let's just look a little bit about it. So 
uh, I put an advertisement. So I, this was done at Stanford University and I put an advertisement in the local newspaper, wanted college students for prison, study of prison life. 75 people answered the ad. We gave them personality tests, as you can see, and interviews. And I chose 24 who were the most normal and most healthy, and then randomly assigned one to be prisoner, one to be guard. And for psychologists listening, that is the independent variable in this study. Uh, but what made the study unique is I arranged with the local police in Palo Alto to make mock arrests of all the boys who were going to be prisoners. So this is, uh, they, went to, they went to their homes uh, or wherever they were, were staying uh, and then said, uh, you wanted for arrest of armed robbery. And even though the student didn't know, he did, hadn't done that, nevertheless, they, uh, they got handcuffed and went, went downtown to the police station. And here you can see uh, uh, the first prisoner being arrested, handcuffed, put against a police car, searched, and has his neighbors looking in, looking on. Next. Now in the study, uh, on the left, you can see the prison guards had symbols of power, billy clubs, handcuffs, whistles, and everybody in the study, who, uh, the staff, always had to wear silver reflecting sunglasses so that no one could see their eyes. On the other side of the screen, uh, go back please quickly. Oh, on the other side of the screen, you see prisoners uh, who are, are in smocks uh, and all they had, they, we took away their name and they became numbers. So each prisoner had to learn his number. So that's again, de de dehumanizing that you no, you no longer have your identity that we give each other with our names. You are simply a number. Next. Yeah, so if you look on the left, it, the guards, again, they're all college students. They have no experience being, being they not, most of them knew nothing about prison. And so the guards started with menial tasks, you know, push-ups, jumping jacks. But then I should say, there were three guards who worked eight hour shifts and there were three prisoners in each of three cells. So it's nine and nine at the beginning, but soon the guards began uh, to do more and more humiliating and degrading things. They stri stripped them naked, they taunted them sexually and sexually degraded them. Within 36 hours, the first prisoner to be arrested had an emotional breakdown from the abuse by the guards. And it worsened daily until Five prisoners had to be released. Uh, I ended the study after six days. I had, it was supposed to go for two weeks, but it had spun out of control. Next. So uh, here's a, uh, the BBC in London did a, uh, a re retrospective of this, of my study. And here's a short video, uh, which takes you into the prison. You can see what it looked like. Please play. No sound. In this cartoon, it summarizes this basic social situational view of evil. There are two off-duty policemen. One says to the other, I'm neither a good cop nor a bad cop, Jerome. Like yourself, I'm a complex amalgam of positive and negative personality traits that emerge or not, depending on circumstances. So we all are good and bad. That's what they're saying, like this slide I show good and evil but it's the circumstances that we grow up in, the circumstances that we're put in uh, that, that helps promote the goodness in us or the evil in us. Next. 
So I wrote several books after the Stanford Prison Experiment. The first thing I did, I focused on shyness, what makes people shy. I summarized all the research I had done uh, for the looser, in the looser effect, uh, a book to 2007. And also in that book, I talked about research, uh, my experiences uh, in Abu Ghraib prison, uh, my experiences with evil uh, in, in America in 9-11. Then I did research on time, time paradox, time therapy. Uh, and then uh, the last thing I focus on is why young men around the world are addicted to video games. Next. So as a, the loser effect helps us understand the nature of evil. So this is probably the most important thing that I ever, ever, have ever done. And so the first 15 chapters are about evil. And the last chapter introduces the question, we now know how good people turn evil. Is it possible for ordinary people to become a hero? Uh, and if so, maybe we have to change the conception of hero. So shyness research and treatment, I was the first one to study shyness uh, in, in adults. And, and, and also we set up a shyness clinic uh, and a program, which is still going on. I started this way back in 1977. I wrote this book, I, but I started right after the prison study in 1972. And our clinic is still going on. Next. So I conceptualize shyness as a self-imposed psychological prison in which the shy individual is both guard and reluctant prisoner. And in that, in that self-imposed prison, it limits your freedom of speech, your freedom of association and action. The interesting thing about shyness is no one says you are a shy person. That individual says, I am shy and therefore I can't answer the question. I can't ask the girl for a date. Uh, I can't ask my boss for a raise. So it's so that's so shyness is a unique psychological disability. Finally, oh, so I should say, uh, we we created our shyness clinic and we're a hundred percent effective because shyness involves three things. People don't know how to communicate, and then we teach them social skills. People have negative self thoughts. They say, I'm ugly, I'm too fat, too skinny. And then we give them behavioral, uh, cognitive behavioral modification. And then some, some shy people get emotionally overloaded, they blush. And for them, we give them relaxation training. And so for each person who comes for treatment, uh, we find out which, if any, all three of those things are, are creating their problem. And then we can eliminate those. And that's why we are 100% effective. Finally, let's uh, skip over other things. We want to inspire everyday heroism. So when I was a child growing up, uh, Superman, as you see in the middle, was the first comic book in America. Uh, and Superman was my idol. He could do everything. Uh, and here are other, over time, the heroes multiplied. But these should not be the heroes of our children. So I say no. Slide, no. Why? Why should they not be? Next. So they shouldn't be our heroes because they don't have a brain. They are the brainchild of a cartoonist. And so what I'm asking everyone in the audience, especially young people, that you have a brain and the idea is use it, use it wisely, use it well, and use it to become a hero. So there are three dimensions I see of heroes. They act on behalf of others in need or in defense of moral causes. Heroes are aware of their risk when you take a chance to save somebody, you, is it, you could get hurt, a risk to life, a risk to finances or career. Career if you're a whistleblower. Whistleblowers are people who expose evil in, in businesses. And the interesting thing, I've been studying heroism for dozens of years, Every time somebody is labeled a hero, they say, no, 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 I wasn't a hero. They're always modest and humble. And that's what's unique about uh, this concept, these people who are heroes. And moral courage is at the core of heroic action, whereas bravery as the is the core of military action. Uh, when, when soldiers 
uh, risk their life to help others, other soldiers in, in need. So I want to promote a new conception of heroes with three Ds, democratized, demystified, diffuse. Anyone can be a hero. You don't need any special inequalities uh, or family background. And I also want to focus uh, away from the standard concept of solo heroes, individuals who do special things. And what I'm trying to promote, especially with young people, uh, team heroes, ensemble heroes, uh, uh, people working in pro-social networks. And so I'm I've been trying to promote ensemble heroes in schools where students combine to oppose bullies and bullying. Why do we need heroes? Uh, we need heroes for several reasons. They shift the social norm from being passively compliant to pro-social action. Secondly, true heroes put their best selves forward in service to humanity. Heroes are the force of good that oppose evil in all of its many forms. Both the perpetrators of evil, the evil of action, uh, as we, again, as we're seeing in, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, but also there's the evil of inaction. This is revealed in public apathy and indifference to vital issues. And for me, the most vital issue for all of us is the cli impending climate change disaster. So, uh, one second. So uh, heroism creates a positive ripple effect. Once you do something heroic and other people see it, this ripple effect spreads that it increases the likelihood other people will do it. I interviewed uh, former President Barack Obama and I asked him if heroes are special people. And he gives a wonderful answer, very, very, um, uh, with great insight. And he says, no, heroes can be ordinary people. And he mentions an American woman uh, named Rosa Parks. So I'd like us to take a minute to listen to Obama, what he says about heroism in general. And then what, who, is, who, who was Rosa Parks or why was she heroic? Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what's wrong with that. We couldn't do the, the video. Um, so, yeah, so Obama said um, um, that heroes can be ordinary people. The important thing is for all people, when they're in a, in a threatening situation, to act heroically, to take action. And when you do, your action ripples when other people see it. And then he mentions this woman, Rosa Parks. She was, she was a poor lady who worked in Montgomery, Alabama in the South of America. And she was a seamstress that she fixed dresses for rich ladies. Uh, and then one day she got on a bus and in America in those days, all transportation was segregated. There were, even though they pay, put blacks and whites paid the same money, blacks had to sit in the back of the bus. And she refused to give up a seat to a white man. And she was arrested. And she became prisoner of the state 7053. In, in, the, back of, in the back of this photo, you see a man. He's Martin Luther King Jr. And together with Rosa Parks, they started a national movement that finally got all buses and trains in America 
to be desegregated. So here, her, her heroic action of saying, you know, I will not give in and, and be forced to give my place up that I'm sitting down to a white man. And then she was willing to suffer for it and change the law of the whole of the United States of America. Next. So m most heroes we think of as men. I think of, Mar again, Martin Luther King uh, and uh, Nelson Mandela and many more. But also I focus, since I, since I became aware of Rosa Parks, I focus on women as heroes. Uh, so this looks like a job for superwomen, not just supermen. Next. So here's a superwoman in my life. Uh, her name is Christina Maslach. Uh, and here's it. Oh, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this. Uh, if you can hear it, I'll just I'll just say what it was. Uh, uh, she was the one who made me stop the Stanford prison experiment. Uh, and she said, you know, she looked in at, at the study and said, what you're doing is terrible. You have been changed by your situation. Uh, these are not prisoners. These are not guards. These are students and you love students and students love you. So, so you know, come to your senses. And then what happened was I ended the study the next day. So let's see if this plays, but I think maybe none of the videos are playing. Okay, so, so how did I deal with this heroic challenger of, Next. So th this is what we both look like in 1972. Next. We were married the next year in 1972 and coming up in August is our 50th anniversary and we've been happily married and have two wonderful children and a grandchild. So the Heroic Imagination Project I organized called HIP we're a nonprofit organization teaching people to stand up, speak out, and act to change the world for the better. Our approach is based on the premise that ordinary people are capable of taking extraordinary actions. We want you to stand up, speak out, and change the world. And we start with children. I mean, children can be heroes. Uh, our heroes usually are adults, but children can be eco heroes, uh, helping to do recycling, helping in many ways to. to um, get, get rid of waste. Uh, and so anyone can be a hero, man or woman, or even young children. We, we have a unique educational program. We have, we have modules I created uh, uh, that we license, uh, and as you'll see around the world, for, for children uh, through adults. We're in colleges and high school, corporation, public organizations, community groups. And, and our, our lessons are um, organized around basic social psychological principles. I created these lessons, uh, uh, as you'll see in a moment. So, for example, one lesson is bystand, as you see in the top right. Um, that is, um, my lesson is how to transform passive bystanders into active upstanders. And then I have videos in the lesson and examples in question and answer. You know, another one is how to change prejudice and discrimination into understanding and acceptance of other people. Another one is mindset, which is really important be, in, beyond heroism for all of us. How to transform a, a, a fixed, narrow mindset into a dynamic growth mindset. So these are three lessons, and then we're developing uh, other ones. So a hero in training starts with small steps every day. And so what I'm telling everybody in the, your audience, make someone feel special every day. How do you do it? Learn and use their name. When you ask, hello, what is your name? You got to remember it. And then follow that by giving a genuine compliment to say you know, something about what they said, how interesting it was, how they look. Uh, and so people don't give compliments and compliments are like a glue that, that cements uh, people together in the human condition. 
So I, as Obama said, we all have a ripple effect uh, that when you do something good, it spreads. Remember your actions make a difference. And also when you don't act and other people see you not, uh, not doing something, uh, that, that also has an effect. So for example, when someone says a discriminating term against Roma people, against black people, you have to say that's not, that's not appropriate. That's not right. Uh, your inactions mean that person who was prejudiced gets supported. And we, I want you to change your perspective, be socio-centric, not egocentric. And when you do, me becomes we, I becomes us. Uh, and in my classes, I have students be, be practice being a positive deviant for a day. Like you go in the shopping mall and you, you skip or you, you um, sing a song. Uh, it's not extreme, but people will, will put pressure on you uh, for you to conform, to not do it. In this setting, we don't do that. Well, why not? Next. So our program, uh, oh, so there's many more things. Uh, in, in my standard lecture now, I always include pre, uh, Dr. Z on his, uh, 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 President Zaleski. Uh, uh, I always include that in my lectures. I didn't get a chance to put that slide in. Uh, and again, and, and then we always talk about um, uh, what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, how can we help? How, what can, can we make donations? So the program I just described is all of these nations around, around the world, in Australia, Iran, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, and in Sicily, I'm Sicilian. My family is 100% Sicilian. And in Sicilian, we work in Palermo with African migrants so that the Sicilian government allowed African teens to migrate from Africa to, to Sicily and all of them went to Palermo. And my team there taught them Italian, uh, gave them housing, and now they become our trainers. So the HIP program in, in Sicily is all with African and Muslim trainers training white Catholic kids. And it's been very successful. Next. So here's a picture on the top right is the, the Marto Center in Poland. Uh, below that is, here's our program in Sicily with the, the African um, teens who are now much older. We've been doing the program there for, for five years. Uh, and there I am in other, giving lectures in other places uh, around the world. Next. So with that, get involved, support our hero projects uh, to see what we're doing. And we're doing new things all the time please go to www.heroicimagination.org or contact us if you want something very immediately and specific. Uh, there's a man who works for me, Matt Winkler. And if you just write admin at heroicimagination.org, uh, he will answer your questions and give you uh, specific advice. And with that, one last slide. Oh, and now we have a hero club for, for youngsters. Um, uh, it's, it's his, his uh, HTTPS www.heroclub.org. And so we just, we, we just developed this this week. We just put it on the, on the website. And so any young people listening should go there and see the interesting things we're doing that involve uh, youth uh, in a, now first in America and then ideally around the world. Next and last. So Dr. Z, thank you for your attention and your caring. And I hope we can work together to make this a better world and reduce evil, get rid of evil and promote goodness. Thank you. Thank you so much, wonderful. Um, a quick clarification about the technical issues. Apparently some people did hear everything and some people did not hear the sound. So I apologize for that. We will send the links to them directly. And now I'll just uh, pass the word to Natalia. She can um, moderate the second part and uh, moderate the questions. So Natalia, please. Um, hi, hello, uh, Professor Zimbardo. Thanks so much for 
uh, you know, given this lecture and this time, so I'm a long time reader for, and, you know, learned about the HERO project still like a decade ago and was very curious about that. But of course, now on behalf of the Ukrainian public, of course, I'm rethinking what you what, what you write and tell in the context of the Russian uh, aggression in Ukraine, like in this bigger context, not really individual, but when we speak about societies. So really, um, my first question would be, you really, some of your works, especially on the Abu Ghraib, uh, you really underline that it's indeed not about a rotten apple, you know, the, the somebody who misconduct, it's about the system. Uh, but in that case, we were speaking about the prison, you know, where there was all this environment. Uh, and could it be that uh, there would be this large misconduct system of the big organization, of the whole organization, or like the Russian army, or like the security service? So it's not really like the unit. And yeah. how then it works? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, yeah, so the question is, that's why I tried to say in the earlier slide, what is the unit that we're focusing on? Typically, it's the individual. So uh, right now, uh, the media is focused on Putin. So Putin is an evil dictator. In many ways, he's really like, uh, like Hitler. But the terrible things that are being done in, in Ukraine are being done by Russian soldiers. You know, way, way, and... Putin does not tell them every day what to do. They are doing horrific things. I mean, killing people, uh, killing children, uh, blowing up schools, blowing up churches. So, so that's what I'm saying. So evil spreads. And that once, once you do an evil deed and get away with it, uh, then it's going to, it's, you get reinforced for it. And it's really, but it's, why do they do it? It's about power. The most extreme power there is, is for me to have the ability to kill someone else because they have the ability, I know they have the ability to kill me. So that's what war is all about. But in this case, it's, it's not a war with, with soldiers are risking their life against an enemy. Uh, yes, there, is, there are Ukrainian troops that are, that are doing great things, but essentially it's, it's soldiers in a war uh, the usual constraints that, that limit immoral action are removed. So essentially it's, you can do anything you want. Uh, and we've seen this in every war. I mean, soldiers committing uh, horrific atrocities. Uh, that's what happens in war. And, and it, it's only when the commanders of the soldiers put limits on that you cannot kill civilians. Uh, you cannot destroy um, 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 churches. Uh, so with, without the constraint by leaders, soldiers in a mentality, I'm at, we are at war, there are no limits to what they can do. And this is horrific. I mean, I, I, I can hardly look at the evening news. Uh, you should know that every, every single night on CNN and uh, local news, there are reports of what's happening today in Ukraine. Uh, and people are very sympathetic, but you feel helpless. It's going on over there. And what can you do? And um, then uh, I do understand that we speak about the systems, you know, like army or the, the leadership, where there are the leadership. But also my question is that, you know, of course, as sociologists, uh, we have here Timothy with us, you know, we understand that we should be careful about understanding the public opinion in Russia, you know, whether the whole society or how much of the Russians would support this actions of uh, Putin and his army. But we do see that quite a lot of people do that openly. So do you really see how the, this Lucifer effect works with the societies? Could that also spread into the larger, you know, group of people rather than exactly those who persecute, uh, you know, who yes. commit atrocities? Yeah, see, the critical thing, which I didn't mention earlier, is the most important power is to control communication so that, that Russian people are supporting Putin because the communication that comes out through the media says we are liberating so again, also the language is, we are liberating Ukraine. 
we are denazification as if ukraine had been overrun by nazis so, so Pete, i was amazed to see Jeep, uh, people are in in russia are supporting putin but then i realized they don't see the news that i see that you see they see the news that uh, of good things russian soldiers are doing they might have a, a picture on the media of a Russian soldier holding a child's hand, crossing a street. They don't see that same soldier shooting a child in the head. So the real power, which I didn't have in my slide, is the power to control communication. Uh, that the, Because communication in our modern age is, is the reality. That How do you know what's happening anywhere? You know, as I said, I turn on CNN. Well, there's other other channels in America's channel two, uh, which which is always more supportive of big business, supportive of of um, dictators than CNN would be. So uh, and then if you uh, if again, uh, you know, a bit follow this uh, this idea, we do have also the discussion about the responsibility. So, and there is this discussion whether there is the collective responsibility. So for instance, if we speak that, you know, system creates the environment, you know, the people are turned to who they are uh, within, uh, be because of in, in particular circumstances. Uh, so at the same time, it could be an excuse for some person say like, it's not me, it's P system. We live in the authoritarian state or I don't know, we, oh, we, yeah. we, I serve in this army. How do you see this dilemma between the individual responsibility and the collective responsibility of the society for, or, you know, the groups of people for, um, um, you know, all the wrongdoings? Yeah, I mean, again, um, um, it is individuals who commit sins. Uh, I grew up a, a Catholic, and and it's it's you know and it was drummed into us that you know it is your actions that that could be it could be sinful, and and your whole training is to be aware of of if you do certain things or say certain things that 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 is a sin and should not be done. And if you do it, then you have to go to confession and say, forgive me, I, I promise not to do it again. So, so again, it's, it's that balance between individual and situational, but people cannot use as an excuse, the situation made me do it. Uh, because that, that you always have free will to resist. And, and that's all of our training, our hero training is, be aware that there is evil around you, that the evil in various ways, that there, for, for example, again, one of the reasons why there's more crime in poor neighborhoods in every country around the world is there are people there who corrupt other people by having what they need, money. So again, as I said, when I was a child growing up in the ghetto in New York, South Bronx, there would be men who would come and say, I'll give you $10 to take this package down the corner and give it to a man with a hat. And you knew the package had drugs in it. $10 was like a week's pay for kids. But, and some, some of my friends did it and they got there and they were caught by, by a, a narcotics agent. And some of them went to prison. I had friends who were 15 years old who went to prison and were abused in prison. So it's, it's, so he, the man who gave them the money is the evil doer. Uh, and uh, initially we were innocent, we didn't know, but then once we knew, then you had the decision. I need the money and, and I'm weighing getting caught versus getting escaping with the good money because when I get caught, I have no money and I go to jail. And uh, I, I was always amazed by this co concept of the everyday heroes uh, and ordinary heroes. And I actually think that it's very probably also to express that it's also very interesting what's happening now at this war, that we have the institutions as the heroes, rescue teams, you know, the railroad workers, not just this 
except you know those people who really by chance maybe become heroes and people think about them as exceptions but yeah. also uh, if we speak about in particular the case which you looked uh, closely in Abu Ghraib, when there was a whistleblower, there was somebody who told that some wrong things are happening. Yes. Um, and you need a courage for that. But what are the basic environment uh, for this courage, for a whistleblower to speak out? I'm speaking about that in the context that, of course, if there is a democracy and you know there would be a court or there would be an independent media who support you, you probably would do that. But what you do, can we expect this you know, courage to become a whistleblower in the authoritarian and dictated societies if it's not really encouraged by vice versa? So you go against the system in environment which is still would be against you. Yeah, that's a problem. I mean. I mean, again, it's the individual versus the system. Now, it, just imagine you are a, a, a school child in, in Russia uh, or a, a child of any age, it could be a college student, and you happen to find out what's happening in Ukraine. How do you go about opposing it? Now, you know that if you oppose it, publicly, you go to prison, and then your voice has no, no power. So in many cases, this is where, uh, in, in previous times, uh, people banded together and created an underground. The concept of underground means uh, you oppose the system, but you don't, you, you don't want to be visible, because if you're visible, they could shoot you, or they could put you in prison, or they, <clears throat> so, so typically, What's important is for people to try to find other people who share the same values and ideas. And, and you organize uh, where, it's, where it's an authoritarian system, you cannot organize publicly. So you, ha you have to spread ideas, you know, subliminally or underground. Um, um, and, and this, this happened in, in every, every nation that the Nazis had conquered, they would, always, they, would, they would always create an underground, typically of young people who oppose them, but you want, you want to live. You can't be a dead hero. Uh, dead heroes get remembered years later. Uh, so you want, to be a, you want to be a live, effective hero. So it means that everybody listening to us should start thinking, what would I do? If I were in this situation, what would I do if I lived in Russia and I understood somehow what was happening in Ukraine? Let's say people send me send me uh, uh, email messages or other things. You know, what could you do? So this is something it's good to think about for all of us. Uh, what could I do as an individual? What should I do? What would I do? Um, and, uh, you know, coming back to maybe something else, you, again, you sometimes, you quite often and uh, quite a lot explained the condition which, uh, you know, still forces people to show, let's say, the worst of themselves. Uh, but um, I'm now going back, not really that to Russia, but to the Ukrainian society. And the war itself, you know, even if it's super just, it, it just war, uh, it's toxic, you know, it, it, and especially if people are trying to, be the be to, to show the best of them, if they probably see some horrible atrocities, if somebody darling has been killed or tortured, you know, there is the explanation why people can feel hatred, why they would be driven by the negative emotions after the atrocities. Uh, they might become bitter. They might uh, demand revenge. So, and I see that in, you know, like in, in different people. So, do you see that there is some limit for justification and you know like how to deal with this hatred should it be you know accepted in some moment because it's very hard to say people you have no you, you don't need to hate because you know after people seen some uh, atrocities which you know can't be you know go beyond something humans should yeah. should do and how to work with that yeah that that's a hard question i mean um so, so um, you're a Ukrainian per citizen, and you observe from a, from a hidden place Russian soldiers doing horrific things uh, to uh, your people. And so 
what you want to do is have the power to kill them. But essentially, then once you kill even the enemy, you are a killer. Um, and, and so the question is, how can I express the deep feelings of anger that I feel <clears throat> without killing, without, just, without also wanting to be a killer? Um, and, this, <clears throat> and then this is why I said earlier, for me, the key is somehow trying to start or be part of an organization of resistance. Um, that again, as I said, I, I studied extensively uh, the Nazification of different places in Europe, and there were always groups, and it was almost always young people, uh, college age people, who, who would form form a group to oppose the, to challenge the propaganda that would come out and say, no, it's a lie. This, and um, but you got to be a wise hero, otherwise you become a dead hero. So so it's. It's, uh, and I'm sure right now in, in throughout Ukraine, there are young people who are developing methods of, of opposition uh, to the Russians, but doing it in a sensible way where, 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 where they, their message gets through uh, to other Ukrainians. So again, partly it's, it's how, how to keep your, your colleagues, your neighbors from getting de severely depressed and giving up, you know, to say, no, th this will pass, that this is an ugly moment in our experience, in our life, but we have to maintain our solidarity that is ab above all else. We are U U Ukrainians for democracy, for freedom, um, and, and, and we can't let that be, cr they can't crush our values, they can crush our beliefs. And, and it's easier for me to say that if you're saying it to me as well, and, and, um, and this other person is saying it. So it's, it's sharing your basic values openly and publicly with other people uh, in, in your situation, in your setting. Uh, but in that, uh... Uh, there, there is a question from Yuri. I want to also answer uh, the question from the audience who said, like, what is the difference between the evil people who are aware that they are evil and those who are not aware? And does it really make a difference? Oh, it does make a difference. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, if you're aware that what you're doing is evil, is harming people, then it's intentional. And that's worse than you do something that you didn't realize, uh, typically a side effect, it, it's having a, a bad, a bad uh, effect on other people. Uh, I'm think, trying to think of what an example of that would be. Um, um, that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's the intention to, Knowing, knowingly committing evil uh, is a cardinal sin. Committing evil without your awareness is what we could be called a venial sin. It's still wrong. But, but then the important thing is for others around you to slap you in the face, say, wait, it, wake up. What you're doing is bad. It's wrong. You know, uh, you think you're doing it for this good cause, but you're not. Um, so again, part of the propaganda of dictators is to create that in ordinary people to say, oh, we're here to help uh, revive your economy. We're here to help uh, uh, give you a better, a better future. Um, and so you can't buy into it, so, but it, it's, it's very difficult when the most, the most power in now is who controls the media that most people have access to. The good news is <clears throat> because of the internet, <clears throat> we now have access to media, which is not just within our nation. Uh, we, could, we, could, we could have media access to, from around the world. 
So uh, there was uh, the question, which I would rephrase uh, later, Dmitro, uh, kind of speaking that, you know, you okay, you teamed up with other people, and now you have a group that is willing to kill Russian soldiers. So what's next? But I, you know, is it really, you know, makes it better if you really, as a group, feel this hatred. Uh, but I would make be a follow a bit different thing about the modern armies. Um, you know, doesn't matter what, the, the modern world is made in a way that we believe that the killing is in general not appropriate. You know, that's why the uh, armies are there, um, you know, they, in, in, in democratic countries, they are maybe, they are more not on paper, they are sitting in their offices, they don't really fight. Uh, and we now have the country which has a legit army uh, waging the defense war. However, still there are the debates in the societies, in, in, in a lot of uh, societies, you know, like whether we, should provide a weapon to Ukraine, whether it's morally, you know, justified. So do you see that, you know, in Middle Ages, it was normal in, in a lot of places, we, you know, uh, have this idea of the army as a hero, the people are the main, the people are fighters defending their lands. Now, right. to be honest, it's not something we, we, we speak uh, in, you know, it's not how we bring up the new generation. But Ukrainians are now caught in this you know, old fashioned war when there is an army fighting the occupier. So right. uh, do you really think that, you know, th there is a way to justify, morally justify killings during the war? How do you see that? And, uh, you know, really people are speaking about the rules of the war, but is it really the rules of the war still uh, making it morally, like in the, in the long run, morally acceptable, you know, the killings? Yeah, it's uh, again, these are very profound questions you're asking is that <clears throat> so um, so should I, Philip Zimbardo, donate money to a to a pro Ukrainian cause where I'm told that money is going to go to buy ammunition and weapons, which is going to kill Russian soldiers. So so I am part of the killing chain by donating, you know, and if I know that, I'm not sure I would do it, but still, if the, if Ukrainians don't have guns and ammunition and tanks, you know, they will be overrun. So I would rather the money go for Ukraine to Ukrainian hospitals, because that's a good thing rather than guns are bad thing. But, but so it's, it's really a complex psychological equation of how, how do I help in this situation um, and the most thing i could do is give money i i, I can't volunteer to go etc et to, to do anything else but but when i know my money is going uh for weapons am i am i now not a part of a killing chain but if ukrainians don't have weapons they will be overrun and destroyed so it's 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 really a paradox and with no, no there's no easy solution um, and I guess you have to say in this situation you my usual values have to be suspended uh, I have to promote Ukrainian people Ukrainian soldiers to have the armament necessary to defend their country because if they don't they will be destroyed and so, so it's war in war there are two or more nations and the goal of each one is to conquer the other and you conquer them by killing you know which again is is immoral killing of any kind for any reason is immoral um now you did mention earlier that <clears throat> um the conception of heroes gets to be wider it's people who are uh in healthy groups um uh, during covid they had uh, first responders and uh, nurses who work, you know, in the hospitals everywhere, 20 hours a week, sacri again, sacrificing their own health um, uh, to, to help other people. So in the extreme, you make a sacrifice of time, of money, uh, and, and, and in the extreme, you you're willing to sacrifice your life to help other people. And this is what people in the nursing profession have been doing since, especially since COVID. 
And uh, I have a couple of questions still. Uh, we're running of time, but I'll still use this opportunity uh, to, to ask. So uh, one is really about the uh, collaboration during the war. I mean, Ukraine has a very uh, complicated history, I would explain, because we have a tradition run by Stalin, by Joseph Stalin, that people who stayed at occupying territory could be perceived as a collaborators and later would be, you know, by generation condemned or would seen with a suspicion. Uh, so we should remain cautious. At the same time, could you really explain, so there is this unfortunate tradition of seeing how a collaboration works, but are there any excuses? You know, be, uh, we understand that there would be still, for instance, a local mayor who would be asked to negotiate with the occupying power. And that would be the question for him, you know, whether he would bring the bread to his community or do something, but he would become a collaborator. Right. Uh, so there are those difficult positions. But still, can you really more or less speak about what is the psychology of the collaboration? How to, you know, how would you see and explain it? Uh, because there are the limits to this heroism, as you said, about the dead heroes. But also there are the, mm, some some people might appreciate, and I'm speaking not about people who just stay, you know, but who need to right. do something, who are in charge of some, in some positions. Yeah, so you raise a new term, collaborators. So, um, so to collaborate with the enemy means uh, you're, weigh you're weighing um, the possible good that they could bring because of their power. And this might be food. So let's say you're in a in a town uh, where there's no food. I mean, where the the markets have been destroyed, the the, the land that grows crops have been destroyed, and not, now and I'm the mayor of that town, and and the question is, uh, uh, if I am willing to say, you know, that um, an extreme, if I'm willing to say. The Russians are doing good things, then they will give me food to feed the, the people who uh, who uh, have voted for me. So this is the, this is like the, the, the it's the worst devil's decision making. That that if I have a little power, let's say as a mayor of a town, I want to use that power to um, make the people who in my town live survive well a i want them to survive um, um i don't want them to be harmed and now to what extent do i collaborate with a power above me in this case russia uh, to su suspend some of my personal values in order to get food uh, to get water to get whatever i know my people need to succeed to so survive uh, and that's now, that is a decision that probably is taking place, you know, throughout Ukraine. And, and it was always true in earlier wars. Uh, and there's no simple, there's no simple answer to say, no, I will not give in to the enemy. I will not, you know, in any way share their values. And then people who are depending on me die. You know, so it's, so it's, it's difficult to be righteous when you have the power of people who depend on you uh, uh, and you're not giving them what they, what they need to survive. And my, my final question would be, I, I, it is in fact consisting of two questions because they're, they're in different directions. I won't, still don't want to finish with the question just on Russia because we're still uh, you know, very cautious about, not cautious, but we in a, a Ukrainian society. Uh, and I want to look at future and cure, you know, the way to cure societies. So in this regard, you, you, you said about the, you know, democratization and other tools. However, more or less about the term, to what extent and how fast it's possible to cure those society, you know, which was driven by, you know, those instinct like we, like we see now in, in the Russian uh, media by the Russian leadership. Um, you know, how much positive leadership would be needed and what could be the time frame to really change, you know, change the system so people would, you know, get rid of, of, of this uh, 
this way of thinking and, and or like the, the such institutions like the Russian, Russian army or the whole Russian apparatus. And at the same time, I also want to shortly ask about it in this co context in Ukraine, what also leadership is needed in order in such a dire environment, you know, to preserve this humanity, not to let society to become bitter, you know, because on the ground, there is no way that people don't become bitter. But I'm speaking about like the grand narrative of the society. Right. So right. both my questions are about this kind of resistance and thrive for the positive solution. Yeah, you know, but I, again, what I think is amazing is the positions that Zelensky has taken and that he's now, for me, a, he's, he's a model of the new hero um, that, you know, he says, we will resist, we will not give in, um, and, but we, we will never collaborate. Um, and, and because he was a comedian, there's always lighthearted. I mean, he, he's, in, he's in a town where he's giving a speech and behind him, all the buildings are destroyed. Um, but it's, it's, so what makes him unique is how do you ma maintain your humanity how do you maintain your identity? So he's the president, but we all know he was a comedian. And so some, some of that earlier training comes through, you know, even when he's asking for help. Um, you know, so he's asking different nations, we need your help. Uh, and then he, he'll say, and suppose you don't help, then what? You know, rather than just, we need help, we need help. He gets them to think, if, if you don't wanna help, if you don't wanna give money, then, what other things can you give? Um, and so you, you give moral support, but moral support doesn't go far in, a, in an armed conflict. Um, so it's, it's maintaining your dignity, um, um, trying to re reframe the situation you're in uh, to, make, to make it um, acceptable, palpable, uh, uh, in in a way that that you're not you're not surrendering your values, um, and but ultimately you have to be doing something which is effective. So to say what is effective, effective means to make a change. So what can I do as effective? Now the more power I have, you know, I mean the more power I have, like if I'm the president of Ukraine then I have mo most power of anybody in, in the nation. So, but again, you might just, as we said earlier, the mayor of a town, you know, what power do I have and how can I use it most efficiently, most effectively to make a desirable change? Now, again, what's critical is, let's say for the mayors of all towns in Ukraine to be communicating, what, what, so, so, so this is, any decision that I make in my town should be supported by people in other towns, or they'll say, no, we tried that, it didn't work. You know, so the important part of, of social, political, social political communication is for people who, are, have this, who share the same value, the same position, to say, here's, here's an idea I have, yeah, do you think it will work? And other people say, we tried it, it worked, do it. We tried it, didn't work, don't do it. So with uh, rounding up, because I see the end of the lecture, I just give you maybe a couple of minutes to say having again, this opportunity to have you um, very short and brief. What would be you know, the message for the Ukrainians and the Ukrainians people, and maybe other people in, in, in this particular moment, beyond your lectures, you know, generally at this- Oh, no, no, yes. Beginning. Yeah, so the message is people around the world share your suffering. We now we know in every country in the world what is happening every day in Ukraine. We are surprised, amazed, and proud of your resistance. Um, that that it, it's hard to imagine that this massive Russian army has not overrun and destroyed Ukraine. That your resistance against this, it's like a, a, a bully in school, 
the big bully is hitting a little kid, but the little kid is not giving in. And he said, you're the little kid on the block and the big bully is the Russian, Russian, uh, Putin's Russian army. Uh, and it's admirable the, the extent to which you are resisting and in many cases fighting off uh, the enemy. Uh, you know, again, I always look at the long-term thing. What happens in Ukraine once, it, if and when the Russians leave? Every single town needs to be totally rebuilt. I mean, it's going to cost billions of dollars. And that's, that's where money should, will come in, should come in from the UN, from, from rich nations like America and others, and I'm sure it will. Um, so, but right now it's, what's needed is to keep, maintain the high morale of all Ukrainians, to give uh, President Zelensky all the support he needs uh, in every way he needs it. But again, he's going on the air. I mean, nobody's ever done that. He's made 20 or 30 uh, speeches at the United Nations to American presidents, you know, one on what one, one on one, but publicly uh, to all these leaders. And that's why he himself has gotten so much sympathy uh, around the world for the Ukrainian cause. Um, and, and again, as I said earlier, it's, it's the modern day era of a universal communication. So he can, he can be in a dugout in, in Kiev, you know, talking to President Biden uh, in, the way, in America, in, in the, the uh, White House, or talking to you know, someone in Tokyo. And he's done that. So the brilliant thing is using, he's using them. He knows how to use the media in, a, in the most effective way that I've ever seen any uh, leader do. So thank you again. And I'm also happy that we're finishing this, uh, you know, uh, the lecture in this positive, still hopeful thing where we speaking about the rebuilding and the future and the positive examples. Though you are known as a person writing a lot about the evil, right. but we during the war we're having this positive idea. So thanks a lot and thank you for listening to us. Uh, and Timothy, you are rounding up. It's my pleasure. Well, what can I say? Thank you so much. I've been listening to this conversation with a great pleasure, Professor Zimbardo. Thank you very much, Natalka. Thank you. And to everyone in the audience, please join us next Tuesday. We'll have a conversation with uh, Timothy Snyder. So thank you very much and enjoy your day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.